Hello ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, innies, outies, and in between us. My name's Dan, welcome back to another Pat Reports. It's Thursday, May the 7th, 2020. Today we can start with a couple of updates to previous reports. On the 10th of January and the 19th of March this year, I reported about Sergeant Lee Cocking of Avon and Somerset Police. 38 year old Cocking was charged with a corruption offence after an incident in Western Supermare on Christmas Eve in 2017 in which he was accused of exercising police powers and privileges improperly in that he had sexual contact with a woman in a police car. Sergeant Lee Cocking of Labour and Way, Cheddar, Somerset pleaded not guilty at Gloucester Crown Court on the 13th of March to misconduct in a judicial or public office. The charge stated that while acting as a police sergeant in the Avon and Somerset Constabulary on December 24th, 2017, he carried out an action of willful misconduct to such a degree that it was an abuse of trust within that office. Although his defense is that his post-traumatic stress disorder presented itself at the time and that he was the unwilling recipient of sexual touching by the woman and that he was faced with a threat that if he did not participate, he would be subject to a complaint about him. Cocking, whose trial is scheduled to start in August, appeared on Tuesday on a Skype call at Gloucester Crown Court. Ray Tully, defending Cocking, said he had given a lift to a young woman who had been on a night out. Mr Tully said the defendant was sitting in the driver's seat when he was a subject of sexual contact. The lawyer told the court that Cocking's post-traumatic stress disorder, which has kept him off work for lengthy periods, was a factor in the incident. Mr Tully also said in an earlier hearing that his PTSD presented itself in how he processed and reacted to what had happened. He was faced with a threat that if he did not participate, he would be subject to a complaint about him. Apparently Cocking suffers PTSD after an incident 18 years ago, although that incident hasn't been disclosed. Cocking has again pleaded not guilty to exercising police powers and privileges improperly. Avon and Somerset Police confirmed that Cocking is suspended from duty while the legal proceedings continue. He is on bail ahead of his next hearing at Gloucester Crown Court on July the 6th for a pre-trial review and a seven day trial is listed to begin on August the 3rd. Now I'm sorry, but if somebody's off work for lengthy periods of time due to any form of illness, Surely it comes to a point where they're deemed unfit for work and should be retired or relieved of their position. I used to work for the Freemasons, the funny handshakes and all that. I was in hospital for three months following an operation and although they kept the position open for an extended period of time, it got to the point where they just simply couldn't hold my position open any longer and I was let go. Police privilege, eh? On the 29th of April, I reported about a mysterious person taking their daily walk in Hellesden near Norwich whilst wearing a 15th century plague doctor outfit. Well, Norfolk police said at the time that they wanted to identify the person so they could have some words of advice. At the time, Norfolk police said uh, officers were aware of concerns raised about an individual who was seen walking around the Hellesden area wearing a plague outfit. They said that no offence had been committed, but officers were keen to trace the individual in order to provide words of advice about the implications of his actions on the local community. Well, it's been reported now that the individual has in fact been identified as a boy in his late teens and that Norfolk police have told him off. <laughs> told him off? For what? I mean, who do these people think they are telling people off for having a bit of fun? You know? Well, that's it folks, Halloween trick, trick or treaters are fucked. What kind of cretinous spunk trumpets do Norfolk police think they are? Since when has their remit, or since when has the remit of our great British Bobby been to police fashion? Now let me be fair here, it's not just the police, as locals seem to have no sense of humour and are clearly a bit jackbooted themselves. Locals on the Hellesden Life and Events Facebook page complained about the menacing plague doctor stalking the streets. One said, just casually strolling around the village in a plague costume. That's just not normal, is it? Do it indoors, it's bloody terrifying for poor little kids. Well, from what's been reported, he was hardly stalking the streets, and I fail to imagine any kid, unless their parents have frightened them over it, who is going to even know what the costume represents. I mean, 
How hard is it to tell your kid it's just someone in fancy dress? Other villagers said wearing the outfit is not illegal and asked what harm he was actually doing. Insurance worker Fiona Fahi, 49, decided to film the shadowy figure when she saw him pass. She said, I just thought he was a weirdo when I first saw him. Then I thought of the kids and old people he may have scared, especially those with anxiety issues. It's quite a strange costume to wear at this difficult and strange time. Yes, it's strange. And what is your point exactly? Strange is not against the law. It's not a policing issue. Just because you don't like something or don't get the humor of it, doesn't mean you should be inviting the police to go and check their thinking. It's about time the police turned around and told these people making reports to check their thinking. Another resident said, my first reaction was that he looked quite ridiculous when I saw him on Saturday afternoon because it was 20 degrees C and he was dressed from head to toe in a black suit. Okay, so does that mean it's ridiculous for Muslim women to wear burqas? People really need to think before they act and stop being utter snowflake morons. Unfucking believable. The Metro has written an article highlighting well-known people who have broken lockdown rules but should have known better. Following the resignation of Professor Neil Ferguson, advisor to the Government and SAGE Committee, whose advice and calculations were the key factor in all of our freedoms being restricted, allowing his married lover to travel across London to visit him on more than one occasion after the lockdown was implemented, the Metro has decided to name and shame some others who have allegedly flouted the regulations as well. Now I say allegedly because some of these people haven't actually flouted anything. And in fact, it's only some people's opinions, including the police, that they have. First up, and this is in the order they were written about in the article, Nigel Farage, former MEP, who was spoken to by police after traveling to Dover to film on what he called an illegal migrant scandal. Well, even after my mistake in Tuesday's video, it does in fact turn out that based on government advice, he is, or at least was at the time, classed as a key worker, as not only was he discussing illegal migrants, but also the possibility of any one of them coming to the UK with coronavirus and being untested. So the Metro, being a newspaper, should have known themselves before trying to name and shame. Next up is ex-chief medical officer doc, uh, for Scotland, Dr. Catherine Calderwood, who resigned after being caught out after she travelled with her family from her main home, or at least the home she was in at the time of lockdown, to a second home more than an hour's drive away. Robert Jenwick, housing secretary, is up next. Jenwick was caught travelling more than an hour to visit his parents despite his warnings that people must remain at home. Mr. Jemrick was also criticised for travelling 150 miles from his London property to his Herefordshire home, and then he from there he travelled to his parents' residence in Shropshire. He defended his actions, saying he went to deliver food and medicine to his isolating parents. I am so sorry about the noise. Now, personally, if I th I think if he travelled to his parents with supplies, then it shouldn't matter how far he had to drive. I would drive or travel the full 250 miles to my parents if I had to. So I personally think this is another false name and shame. As the government has said, you can travel to provide support and there is no limit in the distance you can travel. Stephen Kinnock, MP for uh, Aberavon Aber in South Wales, was named and shamed for visiting his dad in London on his birthday. He posted a photo on Twitter showing himself socially distancing when South Wales police replied. We know celebrating your dad's birthday is a lovely thing to do. However, this is not essential travel. We all have a part to play in this. We urge you to comply with lockdown restrictions. They are in place to keep us all safe. Thank you. Well, talk about hypocrites, especially when the police seem so keen on driving around to wish young children happy birthday en masse. I don't personally see the problem if he was socially distancing. There's no doubt, like many of us, he hasn't anything better to do. However, the police do have better things to do and Although I'm not knocking the gesture, should a dozen cops really be driving across towns to go visit a child whose birthday it is when a visit from the community police constables would probably have sufficed? Oh wait, is there such thing as community police anymore or are they all corporate police these days? Now I'm not going to go through all of these on this list here in this video, but the link to the article is in the description should you want to. I just wanted to point out the differences between some of the more higher profile people 
who have actually ignored the restrictions and those who have been accused of ignoring them. Now you may remember some weeks ago Derbyshire Police posted a video online showing how their drone was flying over the Peak District identifying and shaming people who were out for a walk. Well, Derbyshire Police Chief Constable Peter Goodman has now resigned, although the force is stressing that there is no link between the drone incident or the lagoon incident where the force decided to dye a blue lagoon black in order to deter people from visiting it. Former Supreme Court Justice Jonathan Sumption QC likens the force's approach to the restrictions on public movement to a police state claiming that filming walkers with drones was disgraceful and shamed our policing traditions. In a statement he said, it has been my privilege and pleasure to lead Derbyshire Constabulary and I'm very proud to have been part of such a hardworking and dedicated organisation. I have seen many changes during my career, in particular the change to crime trends. Technology now plays a large part in crime and I have been lucky enough to be involved in the work that is happening nationally to tackle this as the national lead for cybercrime and serious and organised crime. I'm extremely proud of the work that officers and staff do day in day out, most of it going unsung. The dedication to keeping the communities of Derbyshire safe is second to none by all members of the force and I know that this will continue. Peter Goodman's resignation comes after 32 years in the police and 13 years as Chief Constable. Police in Merseyside have arrested 250 motorists on suspicion of drink and drug driving since the lockdown was introduced. Paul Mountford, Casualty Reduction Officer for Merseyside Road Safety Partnership, said the whole idea of the restrictions on vehicle journeys is to reduce the risk of an incident on the roads that would lead to people having to attend hospital and add to the workload of the NHS. So it's particularly alarming that these individuals have chosen to drive after consuming alcohol or drugs, placing themselves and others at great risk. Now I've got to agree that driving while under the influence is bad. I've done it myself and the delay in being able to respond to situations after nine cans of Stella and three lines of Charlie means that almost every morning after I have to take the car to get the dents fixed. That's a joke by the way. However, driving under the influence is very dumb. The thing that grabbed my attention about this article is that the police seem to be boasting that they've caught 250 people in the past five and a half weeks and using it to indicate that the lockdown has caused people to buy more alcohol and take risks when during the same period last year, I actually saw an additional 100 people being caught at 350. Now, I know people are gonna say that the number is higher because there's supposed to be less cars on the road, but people who drink drive are gonna drink drive regardless to lockdown or not. If, I mean, if they're selfish enough to get behind the wheel pissed in normal circumstances, then they're still gonna get behind the wheel during lockdown. Therefore, the number of drivers who drink and drive is likely, in my opinion, to be close to the same. I mean, what do you think? Obviously, please let me know in the comments. A Cheshire police constable who turned off her body-worn camera before entering a hotel bathroom and failed to search a guest for drugs has received a written warning. The incident which occurred at Holiday Inn in Runcorn indicated that there was reasonable grounds to search the guest but she failed to do so. In addition, the constable switched off her body-worn camera before entering the hotel room bathroom where a small amount of a suspected controlled drug was found, although she failed to seize that small quantity of the substance. Cheshire Police spokeswoman said that no further information is to be provided such as the specific type of suspected controlled substance. The matter was listed on Cheshire Police's misconduct page under a heading entitled Breach of the Standards of Professional Behaviour Relating to Duties and Responsibilities and Conduct. I've got to say it's nice to see the good old police transparency again. It's been reported that we will soon be allowed to partake in unlimited exercise outside of our homes from Monday, as Boris Johnson is expected to announce some easings to the restrictions. Now I've got to say that exercise wasn't limited by law anyway. It was only limited by opinion policing. Now the announcement of the easing of restrictions is suggested to come on Sunday to be implemented from Monday. Although gyms will still remain closed, it's said that people will now be able to exercise for longer outside. 
The mirror states that this means keep fit fanatic no longer have to worry about the current hour limit before they have to head back home to ensure they don't break the lockdown. Which is more misinformation? As again, there is and was no legal limit on how many times or for how long you could exercise. The reports list that what you will be able to do for Monday. Unlimited exercise to be allowed, it already was. Employees to be encouraged to return to workplaces that have stayed open throughout the lockdown if safe, which isn't really a change to current recommendations. You can visit garden centres if they reopen. Most of them have been throughout. You can make use of more outdoor spaces, including open air markets, something else that's not really changed. You can visit high streets and cemeteries and something else that's not really changed. So unless I'm missing something here, nothing is changing other than people's perception on what's been allowed and what's not been allowed. The government's draft 50 page blueprint for easing the coronavirus lockdown will be rolled out in five staggered steps between Monday and October. But with the seeds already being planted for a second wave, which will no doubt be our fault for wanting the restrictions relaxed or lifted, I'm sure the relaxation of the restrictions won't last long. The five stage plan currently looks like this. For number one. From Monday, unlimited exercise allowed. Employees to be encouraged to return to workplaces that they've stayed open, that have stayed open throughout the lockdown if safe. Garden centres could reopen while there may be more guidance on the use of outdoor spaces, including open air markets, high streets and cemeteries. Number two, end of May, start of June. Phased return of primary schools in England, starting with year six. Households could be allowed to expand social bubble to meet one other household or family or friends. Three, June, end of. Phased return of secondary schools in England before the summer holidays. Small team sports such as five-a-side football could be allowed along with gatherings of fewer than 30 people. Cafes with outdoor seating could reopen whilst outdoor sports like golf, tennis and angling might resume. Possible return of Premier League matches although behind closed doors. Number four, end of August, start of September. Pubs, bars and restaurants could gradually reopen, although customers would be expected to follow strict social distancing rules. 5. October. Possible return of football fans to matches. Gyms could be allowed to reopen, but any further lifting of restrictions to get back to normal life would be in doubt amid fears of a second wave of coronavirus or an outbreak of seasonal flu. Well, it seems like we're going to be feeling the ill effects of the government's lack of proportionate and timely actions for some time to come. I would, of course, like to hear your views, so please get yourself in those comments and let me know what you think. On Thursday, April 30th, a man in his 40s employed by Manchester City Council's Children's Social Care was arrested on suspicion of sexual activity with a child when in a position of trust and misconduct in a public office. Operation Green Jacket was launched in May 2019 as a multi-agency investigation into child exploitation during 2004-2005, including a fresh probe into the abuse and death of 15-year-old Victoria Agoglia. The man has not been named but has been bailed pending further inquiries and has also been suspended from his duties. Greater Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham commissioned a report investigating the original investigation into child sexual, sexual exploitation in South Manchester, known as Operation Augusta. The report found that social workers knew that one 15-year-old girl, Victoria Agoglia, was being forcibly injected with heroin, but failed to act. She died two months later. Abusers were allowed to freely pick up and have sex with Victoria and other children from city care homes in plain sight of officials. Greater Manchester Police dropped an operation that identified up to 97, 97 potential sus suspects and at least 57 potential victims. Eight of the men went on to later assault or rape girls. As recently as August 2018, the Chief Constable refused to reopen the dropped operation. Despite the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, Greater Manchester Police say Operation Green Jacket remains a top priority for the force with police continuing to provide support to a number of victims as well as identifying a number of suspects. National Police Chief Counsel Lead for Child Protection, Chief Constable Simon Bailey said, 
Following the peer review commissioned by Greater Manchester Police, it's been recognised that Operation Green Jacket is progressing significantly and I'm encouraged by the strength and approach adopted by the force. The important it's important that police forces continue to work together to tackle child sexual exploitation and a lot can be learned from this Operation Hydrant peer review. In order to continue to protect and support children across the country, Operation Hydrant allows national best practices to be shared nationally with all police forces. Policing will always explore different avenues and opportunities to ensure that children are protected as much as possible. It is challenging and equally important that forces commit sufficient resources to support victims and pursue suspects. The setup of Operation Green Jacket is effectively addressing both these issues. I mean, it's sickening how these creatures manage to work their way into these positions in order to abuse them. And I'm pretty sure all of those comments made at the end of that section were what was said last time an investigation went on that was completely ignored. Big thank you to channel Patreon supporters. Your support is truly appreciated, especially with videos like today when we talk about things like abuse, as YouTube certainly will not monetize videos that talk about that. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts, as I know many of you will. And until next time, stay safe, look after each other, film the police and other officials. Good night all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content and you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so. In the description of every video, there are some links to ways that you're able to help support the channel so I can continue putting out content. If you're unable to help us in that way, hit that subscribe button up the top there. If you haven't already, become a subscriber. That is support enough. Share the videos, comment, like, it all helps. If you're looking for something else to watch, up top there is my latest video. Down the bottom there is a video that YouTube recommends for you.